And Cheryl said earlier, we're just so grateful that you're with us. Um, we appreciate your time, especially during your summer. Um, so we try to make this a little bit um, exciting as much as we can for a virtual conference, but we're really glad to have you. So when we left off, we were talking a little bit about clarity and Dr. Tim prepared you to reset your mind. So now I want you to join on this journey with me for how to continue moving teacher clarity and student learning forward. So we talked a little bit about instructional clarity. Now we're gonna move into um, organizational clarity. So our learning intention is, today we are learning about the necessary components for establishing a positive classroom environment with clear expectations and routines so that all students can learn to the best of their ability and to have the most optimal learning outcomes. And what Heather actually said was absolutely right. A lot of this work that Hattie came from, came from a guy named Fen Fendick. And he also talks about there is such a thing called organization clarity. So I just want you to know that that term that Heather Spade is using has been researched. So we really are moving into organizational clarity. So you'll know that you'll, you'll have succeeded if you meet these two success criteria for the afternoon. You can identify specific strategies that promote a positive classroom environment. And you can also explain how establishing classroom routines and expectations plays a vital role in teacher clarity and student learning. So let's talk a little bit about classroom climate. It's kind of a vague term, um, but it's, one of the most important things, in my opinion, that a teacher can create is classroom climate. So let's look at what the research says about classroom climate. So classroom climate directly influences how students do in school. Now, I'm, I cannot say this enough because it's so important. And uh, I hate presenters that read off the screen, but I had to definitely read that. Classroom climate directly influences how students do in school. So basically you are the keeper of the universe as the teacher. You organize their world when they come into your world. So one of the things that we wanna talk about is the degree to which psychological needs are met will determine the energy and attention that is available for learning. Now you cannot control what their home lives are like or what happens on the school bus or, or any kind of social dynamics that are happening outside of your realm. But whatever climate that you can create that is safe for students will impact their learning because that makes them feel safe and it will create more room for energy and attention for learning. So the things, when climate goes beyond meeting safety and security, and it's more than Maslow's hier hierarchy of needs, um, you have to, there are important dimensions of climate that have to be developed, like community risk-taking and mistake-making and influence. Once you have developed those things in your classroom climate, the learning accelerates. And to add to what Heather say, um, is sharing with you, this comes from a lot of extensive research from Patricia Wolf and Safier and his folks that that learning you know, has to have meaning and to make meaning for students. And yesterday we learned from Dr. John about the science of learning. And so emotions are also involved with learning. And just as Heather said, you know, a lot of our students or some of our students, what we've got to think about is when they're coming back for some of these students, some of them, not all of them, it's about been 1.5 years, I would say, due to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have a little bit of anxiety. You're going to have to kind of reteach them how to be in the classroom again and how to be successful in the classroom. And this is why we chose this particular topic to really stress to you guys because there's a teacher clarity component and then there's the organizational climate component. And it is like what Heather said, you're the keeper of the universe. You help to define the temperature and the temperature's right. And you've made the temperature wonderful in a place where students feel safe and they can make mistakes. Your learning is going to accelerate and Heather here is going to show you how we can do that. Thank you. So I've chosen six components of cultivating climate to talk about with you today. Um, connection, organization, student choice and voice, consistency, 
communication, and love. So this, while Dr. Chen and Cheryl kind of focus on the left brain of instructional clarity, I'm going to focus a little bit on the right brain that has a little left brain mixed in. So first, we'll start with connection. This is crucial in cultivating a climate of clarity. But before I head to connection, Dr. Chen, can you click? Let's talk about some culture killers. So you can go really wrong really quickly in a classroom, and here are some ways to do it. Disorganization. If there is chaos, if there is confusion, there will be a lot of little bodies or big bodies not knowing what to do. Um, it just kind of halts all learning and all progress. Apathetic attitudes. If students and teachers do not know how to empathize with one another or don't care to empathize with one another, then you can't really connect. Sarcasm. Now, while sarcasm is really great at parties and I love to be snarky with my friends, sarcasm can kill a culture if you're using it inappropriately and in a mean way. Poor communication. That goes kind of back to disorganization. You have to be very transparent with all stakeholders or, again, it will breed confusion and then confusion will breed to either no progress or negative communication. And then the last one is, is hugely important, inequitable practices. Right. Dr. John talked a lot about equity yesterday and equitable practices are e extremely important, especially now um, because of the social climate that we find ourselves in. You just need to make space for everyone in your universe and in your classroom culture. So let's talk about creating connections. There are five components that I wanna to highlight today and how to create connections. The first one is being present. Um, as an elementary school principal with 576 students, being present is difficult. And as a classroom teacher, being present is difficult. It doesn't matter whether you're elementary or whether you're secondary, there's always someone or something vying for your attention. What I mean by being present is, it's best if you are engaged with your students whenever they need your presence. So if they're talking to you, make sure you're not multitasking. Make sure you're making eye contact. Make sure you're actively listening. The second one is modeling and requiring kindness. And this seems really super, um, super lovey-dovey, but it pays dividends. If you show your students what kindness looks like and model it for them and expect it from them, they will reciprocate and you will have a happy classroom. The next one is celebrate differences and mistakes. This goes back to the equitable, equitable practices. You wanna make sure that everyone feels welcome. It doesn't matter um, what they look like or how they learn. You wanna make them comfortable in your classroom environment. Right. The, I included mistakes because this is huge. And I, I'm, I'm sad to say that I'm mostly focused in um, primary education because I'm pre-K through five but I know that my students want to be right all the time. And I think middle school and high school students are very similar. So when you see students make a mistake or when they fail, celebrate that because the learning, the really rich learning and the, the things that you will take beyond the classroom um, can be celebrated through mistakes. Mistakes teach us way more than any A plus I've ever gotten. So just make sure you celebrate those with your students. Responsive classroom techniques. Um, I'm hoping you're familiar with this, but basically this is a school of thought that celebrates building a community. Um, one of their big staples is morning meeting where you have a greeting and an activity and a way to share. Um, this is about 15 to 30 minutes that you carve out of your schedule to spend time as a community building the community. This is imperative for making connections with your students. And at the secondary level, these may be at the middle school an advisory program. This may be an anti-bullying. This is the community. These, this is the leadership program. This is the social emotional learning that you often hear mm -hmm. that makes the student fully roundabout. You can take time in secondary to, to have those check in, yes. but it's yes. yeah. Um, but I like what you added, Dr. Chen. That's absolutely correct. And the last thing I want to um, address is hearing your students. We talked a little bit about being present, but actually hearing them. You can listen to them, um, but actually hearing what they have to say um, and letting that information flow through you 
is imperative and remembering what they say later on down the road because they will remember that. So here are some ways that I have made um, connections as an educator. Um, I'm kind of dating myself with a picture of Angela Lansbury. I'm sure some of your parents or grandparents love um, Angela Lansbury because she was in a, a detective show. <laughs> I, loved her too. Wrote. I loved her. What are you talking about? <laughs> I, so what, what I think is a great idea for creating connections is I used to look up all of my students in the yearbook or in power school, whatever um, housing, student housing, information, housing, um, platform you use, and I would memorize their names and faces. It kind of freaked them out a little bit, So, um, but they also knew that I took the time to get to know them before they even walked into my room. So if you like to be a stalker on the weekends, you could always memorize kids' faces and names. Now, in secondary, you teach upwards to 160 to 200 kids. That could be a little more difficult, but um, it can be done. And then also sending a newsletter home, just introducing yourself. And this is obviously a primary example, but high school um, and middle school can do this too, letting them know who you are and that you're just excited for them to join your classroom. Um, so some other ways you can cre create connections is by celebrating student work. Um, this seems like such a simple, simple thing, but when students see their work is being celebrated, um, they feel appreciated and that they feel seen. Um, I also Im implemented a kindness jar. This again seems primary, but you could do something no, secondary in term. middle school. Yeah, um, just to kind of showcase how much kindness we're able to accumulate. Um, I did star of the week. So you could highlight a student every week, um, turn into a writing activity. Anything you can do to create connections with your students, um, eating lunch with them, that is huge because you don't even have to talk. You don't, all you have to do is sit at the table and listen and you will learn so much. Um, also, you could also shadow them and attend some of their resource classes or um, their, uh, what do they call them in secondary, Dr. Chen? Electives. Yeah, electives, yes. Yeah, you can yes. go see what their life is like outside your room. That shows that you care about what, what else they're doing when they leave you. Or even attending a sports event. I can tell you how many of my students really appreciated when I went to either a football game or an athletic event or if even an interscholastic event, like a, a debate thing. Just my presence there of just showing up really mm -hmm. meant everything to them. Absolutely. And this is not an exhaustive list, um, but we wanted to throw out some suggestions that we had. But now what I want you to do is kind of think about all the things we talked about with creating connections with students. And I want you to think about one of the teachers you had. Um, I, want, I want you to think about who your why is, why, why you became a teacher or a teacher who really changed your life um, and put in the, to the chat what they did to make your life better. Because that's ultimately why we got into education. We did not get into education to be, um, assignment police or uh, attendance um, stalkers calling kids to make sure they come to school. We came to school to help kids. So in the chat right now, can you think about a teacher who changed your life and what it is, one thing that they did to make your life better? Dr. Chen, are you seeing any? I'm seeing, I, um, mm -hmm. starting like, I, well, Lydia shared the idea. I had a teacher that demonstrated her belief in me. Oh, yeah. Um, shared their passion and made it interesting and fun. Mm -hmm. Listened, showed interest in developing my abilities. Wrote a poem, gave me a book about writing. Mm -hmm. My high school art teacher, um, she always made me oh. feel valued. When I broke my arm in kindergarten, my teacher came to my house. Before that, I was terrified of her. Love that idea. I actually became a teacher because of a bad teacher I had. But I also had a teacher who took special interest in me. A lot of teachers impacted me. Someone when I stressed, I needed to talk to in the high school. Incorporated my own interest into the daily lessons that the teacher taught. Kindergarten teacher who was the kindest, smartest woman I ever knew. Mm. I'll never forget my eighth grade teacher, Mrs. Bryant. A teacher who gave me choices. choices. A counselor. Mm. Someone who fought for me was able to bond with them. She was fair and compassionate. Yeah, like I, I have an amazing sixth grade team. 
mm-hmm. and on Facebook friends. And one of them, she's so encouraging and tells me how proud she is still of me. Mm-hmm. These are beautiful stories. Yeah. So what I'm hearing a lot, a lot from you is that these people that changed your life and made things better for you, you had a connection, even the even the person who chatted that they became a teacher because of a poor teacher. And by the way, I became an administrator because of a poor administrator um, because I wanted to do it better. That impacted you. Um, But I love hearing all the ways that the positivity, compassion, student choice made a connection in your lives. So what we do every day is super important. Um, So thank you so much for sharing those. So now we're going to get into um, classroom organization. And Dr. Chin and I had a, a long fight about this very colorful slide. No, I actually like this. No, I don't really like this colorful slide. I know. <laughs> Bless her heart. She student let me choice, have student voice. She let me have a little freedom. So, oh, stop it. I was like, you have lots of freedom. We're going to talk about how you organize your classroom. And this is my wheelhouse because I'm a little obsessive compulsive um, about what my classroom looked like and how it was organized. But where do you start? You know, I remember on the first day thinking, where do I start? So I just have some things that we're gonna discuss. I have a slide for each of these, so I'm not gonna read them to you. But what I want you to be thinking about is when we go through all of these different moments in time as a teacher of a classroom, I want you to think about what you want it to look like what you want it to sound like, and what you want it to feel like in your classroom. So let's start with arrival and dismissal. There's a lot to be considered uh, for arrival and dismissal. And, you know, COVID has kind of added a degree of difficulty in this. Um, So we're not really doing a lot of hugging, handshaking, and high-fiving, but we were doing like elbow bumps and um, uh, ankle fives and all kinds of things. We got very creative, but I want you to think about no matter whether you're primary or secondary, I want you to think about how are your students going to enter and exit? How are you going to practice that? It's probably going to happen on day one. How many times are you going to model that procedure? Um, what procedures are going to take place after they arrive, after you meet them at the door and greet them? How is that going to be organized? How often are you going to have to reinforce these? And I will tell you, after every holiday break, it's like the first day of school again. Um, How are you going to provide them with feedback? So when you line them up and they talk, if they're not allowed to talk, are you going to sit them back down again? So in your mind, start thinking about arrival and dismissal, what that's going to look like and how you will give students feedback when they're meeting your expectations and when they're not meeting your expectations. And I think what um, I want to say here is that what Heather is saying is so important. And I think you're going to hear it from also your principals at the various school systems that you are at. We're having to reteach some of our students the routines that we would really think that they would have. But a lot of this is about, again, an organization clarity, being very clear about the what. So this is the arrival and the dismissal, right? So it can be a safe place, a positive learning environment. And then the how is how it's going to look like. You'll know that you're successful and being very clear about that. And then giving feedback to students when they're not meeting that particular goal in organizational clarity. Absolutely. Well, and then that feeds right into morning routines. What do you want your morning routine to be like? Are you going to have a message for them? Is it going to be procedural, affirming, or both? Um, what are your procedures going to be like? What are your requirements going to be? What tools do they need? What are you going to do for those fast finishers who unpack everything in less than five seconds? Of course, it'll be a huge mess, but what are you going to do for those fast finishers? And again, like, how are you going to give them feedback if they don't do it correctly? If they get their homework and don't put it away, or is it digital? Um, so things you need to think about, like how your morning is going to be organized. Will you be playing classical music in the background? Um, What will the lighting look like in your classroom when they come in? Um, What will you do for students who come in late or are absent for that day? So one way to stay organized in the classroom and to, to make sure that you have clarity is to make sure you have every possible scenario thought of and something planned waiting on deck for anything that could happen. I love, someone put in the chat, I love greeting each child at the door. Um, my principal, one of my favorite principal I ever had 
did an activity where we came to a professional development after school and she, uh, we walked in and they were in a huddle and then they made us leave and line back up and she greeted us at the door. And the difference of being greeted at the door and just walking through the door was was amazing. You just felt like you were seen. There was eye contact made. So it's very important to make sure that some someone is greeting your students at the door. The next thing I want to talk about as far as classroom organization is what about supplies and assignments? So how are you going to clearly communicate what their assignments are, where the supplies are located, how they turn things in? Um, are you going to have times where you're in the classroom and you are not allowed to be disrupted? If you do have times like that, say you're doing um, small group testing or um, RTI co data collecting, are you going to wear a tiara so they know not to bother you? <laughs> will you um, will you have a sign up that says come back again soon? Um, think about how you want to convey to students that um, this is what your the expectation is and this is what I'm looking for. Um, this is a huge thing, especially to COVID. Can you go back one quick moment? Yes, I'll yes, yes. Please excuse the technical difficulty. No, no, I wanna talk about the charging station. Just make sure if you can at all um, to have that laid out because if your computer is not, your student's computer is not charged, right. it will put a halt to all kinds of um, learning and it just it kind of disrupts everything. Thank and, and, and I just wanted to mention that Heather is completely correct about this because especially at the secondary level, Mm -hmm. that's time that, that that's wasted on kids mm -hmm. and that's not optimal learning time. So just thinking about like even the charging stations, I totally forgotten about that. That's so key and that's so important. So thank you for that, Heather. And someone also put in the chat um, that teachers aides need to need to have that understanding as well. Yes. Um, and our instructional assistants are our teachers. They might not have the teacher label, uh, but they they work so hard and yes, so they need to be conveyed that information as well. So now we move to transitions and this is a huge time suck for any teacher. Now, now I know I'm talking to an audience of varied experiences, but anyone who's been in the classroom any length of time knows that a, a two minute transition can turn into a 30 minute discussion. So be thinking and the timer was my end all be all. I always had a timer in my hand, it was a kitchen timer, not as cute as this one, but we would set it. We would set goals for ourselves about how fast we want our transitions to be because um, instructional time is, at, is so important and we lose so much of it, you know, when your colored pencils fall on the ground or when your computer's not charged or um, when someone derails the conversation and starts talking about what their uncle did last night at dinner time. Um, so during transitions, you want to think about, are your students allowed to talk? or will that make the transition slower? Do you want them to be fast and accurate or just fast? Normally um, in the K-5 world, they're just fast. So you have to talk about accuracy and neatness. Like you don't just shove your folders in, or your papers in your desk. You calmly put your folder out, put papers in the folder and then put it back. So all of that, that needs to be discussed, which seems silly, but it does. What's a reasonable time for a transition? And that's something you can discuss with your students, you know? Um, and are you going to have verbal or nonverbal signals? Some of the transitions I see in my elementary school are doorbells or um, um, sign language. So that's something you can do. And again, how are you going to give your students feedback? Because transitions, in my experience, can be high stress times for teachers because you're trying to make sure you have all the elements of your perfect lesson, your closure done. And then when students don't meet your expectations, you could be at the end of your rope. So you just wanna make sure you're prepared for giving feedback, whether they're meeting your expectation or whether you're not. So next is movement. And that's a great, it's a great pairing with transitions. How do you want your students to move? Um, in my classroom, I used a great resource. It's called New Management by Rick Morris. He is a lifelong educator and he actually retired. I looked on the website, um, to see if I could get some resources to share with you all. Uh, but he's retired, but he used sign language. So of course, being a good teacher, I stole that from him and we use sign language. So if students had to use the restroom or if students had a question or if students had a comment, I could choose whether I call on someone based on the sign that they were throwing up. So 
when your kids are moving, how do you want them to move? Um, a lot of our kids like to stop and have a chat break. Is that okay with you if you have the timer set or is that a non-negotiable for you? Um, how will they communicate your needs? You know, bathrooms, nurse, um, any, any random assortment of things could happen. I don't know how I'm getting home today. So how do they communicate their needs with you? Um, how will students get a tissue or water? And then are you gonna incorporate some brain breaks? It doesn't matter if you are primary or secondary, kids need to move for sure. So have you factored those in there? All right, let's talk about whole group instruction. So whole group instruction um, is a great tool, but we wanna make sure that there's not a lot of lecturing going on. So again, how are they gonna communicate? Are you gonna have all 25 of them shouting at you? Are you gonna have certain expectations? Are you gonna have a talking stick? Are you gonna have um, like sign language or signals that you have in your classroom that indicate they're allowed to talk? Um, what are you gonna do when you have various um, distractors and time wasters? You're gonna have those a lot. We talked a little bit about how what my uncle did at dinner or how my grandma was late for church and then we had to go all the way to town and like stories can be a huge distraction. Um, how are you gonna be prepared ahead of time so that you can ensure instructional time is protected in whole group. And then how will you know, and this is, this is probably the most important thing we need to consider. I love turning and talking, by the way. How are you gonna make sure your students are engaged? There are a lot of kids that just love whole group instruction because they can fade back and be a wallflower. You wanna make sure that you pull everyone in. One of the ways that I um, use is a lottery picker. So all of my kids are numbered. They have a class number and I would use the lottery picker to pick them. You can also use a deck of cards, anything that looks flashy and interesting and you gotta vary it up, but you wanna make sure that every student is engaged um, during whole group instruction. Oh yeah, someone was saying that they relocate re their desks so that they can use sign language for agree. I love that. And, and as you're relocating and making that circle, you have time to share and actually connect with your classroom community. I love that. Yeah, and someone said that my students have a class number two. This helps with lining up. Uh, Rachel talks about my old school did each classroom had a matrix with each of these topics and with specific expectations written out. Love it, yes. Rachel. Yes. Having it posted in the room was super helpful for the kids and for quick refreshers. Mm -hmm. That repetition, repetition, repetition mm -hmm. that we learned from Dr. John yesterday. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So now we're going to small group collaboration. And this is, um, I think it's particularly tough, especially now given that COVID has taken so much of our social time away. Students of all ages do not know how to communicate. Um, half of your face has been covered. You're not really talking um, because you have your mask on and it's hard to hear and it's hard to speak. So as we move into this next phase of returning to normalcy, we need to consider some things. So what will you have in place for your students so that they can communicate collaboratively? Um, will you have some, um, I don't know, structured story starters or um, framework for how to respond? Well, how will you handle conflict? Because you're not going to be in every small group. Hopefully, um, you're either working with a student or bopping around between groups. But what if there's a conflict? How will they handle it? How will they know how to handle it? How will you train that? What will that look like? Um, how do you ensure that students remain on task? This is a huge one, especially in elementary school. And how long do you model, monitor, and practice small group ex expectations? And honestly, from my 18 years of pre-K through five experience, you do it all year long. Um, it doesn't really ever stop needing to be modeled and monitored. Um, so just be thinking about, oh, I love someone said nonverbal cues, turning and talking again. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say also, um, you're going to have to show them that for our um, Appomattox teachers, yes. but, uh, and, and tell them where we got it. But I would say also, for our older kids, we've developed norms before when it comes to small group collaboration. Mm -hmm. And just asking them questions like, 
you know, what does success look like when you want to work in a small group? Mm -hmm. And the students were very honest. They were like, I don't want to be the only person doing the work. Mm -hmm. And so, well, then how does it look like? So we started to develop group norms based Mm -hmm. on the student voices. And that became so powerful because they owned it and they would call each other on it. You're talking when I'm talking. And we had to model it quite a bit. And we kind of did like a fishbowl. We asked them to show us something based on the norms that was effective collaboration. Show us what effective collaboration looks like and tell us why it's effective. And then show us what ineffective collaboration looks like and tell us why. And they had the funnest time doing these skits. And of course we said G rated, G rated skits. And they loved it and they got it and they called each other on it and it became their group and they became very productive in their groups. So, so quick question here, lottery picker, uh, gadget, where did you get it? Um, it's amazing. I got it from Amazon. It was super cheap. Um, and I actually, and I'll put, I'll put the, um, the original idea wielder of the lottery picker. Why can I not spell today, Dr. Chen? I think you're rubbing off on me. Man. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate that because you had just <laughs> talked to us about how sarcasm should not be used, uh, Mrs. Spade, and that how it's a culture killer. So I appreciate, uh, yeah, you're, mm-hmm. thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so I got it from Amazon. It's super cheap and it's, it, it, the kids love it. It doesn't matter what age they are. And plus it ensures that you can get everyone in there. And what I used to do, um, I used to color one like silver or I'd paint it with nail polish. And so when that came up, everyone got like a Jolly Rancher or a treat or something. So it's another way to cultivate um, class climate. Please excuse my sarcasm, Dr. Chen. No, no, you're excused. All right. So asking for help, this is huge. Um, And we've kind of alluded to all this. I just wanted to draw your attention to it. You know, how do you want them to communicate their needs? Because they're going to be many and they're going to be varied. Some of them are going to be um, like, I need a pencil. And some of them are going to be something really bad happened at my house last night. I need to talk to someone. So just make sure you, you have thought through a plan of what that's going to look like in your room. Are there times, like I said earlier, that you cannot be interrupted? And if there are, that's okay. Just make sure you communicate that with your students because they're receptive and and they're very perceptive as well. They'll understand. And then um, just making sure that they know that you are accessible because that is a huge thing for building a positive classroom climate is knowing that you're there to help. So classroom boundaries. One of the activities that we're doing later, we'll talk a little bit more about classroom boundaries, but are there places that your students aren't allowed? I'm kind of a psycho about my desk. I (laughs) like people touching my things. I can tell, like my mother before me, I can tell when something has been touched. So I share that with my students. I said, you know, this is my space. I don't like when people are touching my space. I'm not going to be touching your space without your permission. Um, So just sharing where the boundaries are. Um, Are they allowed to use the sink if you have a sink? Are they allowed to go into the classroom closet? Are they allowed to open the windows? Things like that. Um, It sounds really silly, um, but if you don't have these boundaries and these um, ideas talked about prior to when school is in full swing, you're going to be like, why are, why are they doing that? Why are they randomly getting up and sharpening their pencil while I'm giving my whole group mini lesson? That makes no sense to me. Well, it's because we didn't talk about it. So um, just wanted you to have that in your thought. And also furniture. I used to tell my kids because before flexible seating was like a fad, I had flexible seating. And um, I used to tell them my classroom is like um, the four seasons. We treat <laughs> like it is very expensive and it's irreplaceable. So just make sure that if you do have special furniture or anything special in your classroom that you want treated in a specific manner uh, to make sure it lasts longer, communicate that with them. And I want to hit on a topic that Lauren brought up here. She said this past year, once we returned in person, these boundaries are where students could go became a big one since we needed to try and keep students six feet Mm -hmm. apart. Mm -hmm. And Lauren, that is such a wonderful point because this is true. And this is why the clarity piece is so important and why we wanted to talk to you guys about organizational clarity. 
because students are not going to know what your expectations are. They're not going to know. So you're going to be setting those expectations with your students and providing them with the feedback to make sure that they're following those expectations for optimal learning. But you are absolutely right, because there's going to be some kids who are extremely anxious. And can I raise my hand? Can I go to the bathroom? Can I get up? Oh, can I go near her desk? Mm -hmm. So these are things that as teachers, even before we begin on day one, that we've got to think about and plan. And the key here is plan, because this does take planning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love this one. Well, originally I had the Wicked Witch of the West and I had substitutes. But after talking <laughs> with Cheryl, um, she said that, that her district, they call them guest teachers. And I thought, you know, that gives substitutes it's a much better um, street cred. You know, if you're a guest teacher, you're coming in as a guest. So Glenda the Good Witch. Substitutes are a huge thing to prepare, to prepare your students for because not only is their routine completely upended, but their entire sense of normalcy is kind of shaken a little bit when you're not there. So one of the things that I want you to think about is how are you gonna prepare them for when a guest teacher does come? What are the expectations? Are they any different? Are they more stringent? Um, how will they handle conflict or disagreeing with a teacher that's not you? Um, one of the things I want you to think about is do you wanna have someone on your team who you trust implicitly to be kind of like the go-to for your class? And they can even pop over and say, okay, so um, Dr. Chen is out today, but I've already talked to the substitute and she knows all the expectations and rules kind of someone who, who has your back when you're out of the building. Um, because you want you don't want learning to be completely disrupted if you have to leave for a sick day, if you have to take a personal day, or if you have professional development. Learning still needs to continue, and if you prepare them, they'll be ready. But this is a huge conversation, and I also offered incentives for when I was out because I felt like that helped a little bit. So I know I'm a fast talker because I'm in, I was raised in a, a Polish Catholic family that's pretty large. And anytime you wanted to get a word in edgewise, you had to talk really quickly um, and make it good. So I'm sorry if I spoke too fast, but we kind of talked about a lot. We talked about arrival and dismissal procedures. We talked about routines in the morning, supplies students might need, transitions, movement, whole group and small group, asking for help and and classroom boundaries and guest teachers. So I want you to think now, what would be one of these strategies or one of these ideas or something on your own that you wanna share with the, with the group for the good of the group that helps with any of these moments that we have as educators? So in the chat, if you could place something that you found helpful or place something that you wanna try or even something that you're thinking about because if you're like me, as soon as summer hits, you're in professional books, you're looking on Pinterest, you're, you're, you're looking all over to find things to improve upon what you did the year before. So what are some strategies that you wanna try to help with your classroom organization? As a kindergarten teacher, every transition and ritual has a song. I love that. If you can tie anything to music, we taught multiplication with music. I love it. Kids love it. Transitions, yes, save time. Cubbies for students and phones to limit distractions and disruptions. I love that as well. The classroom constitution, I love that. We did that every year. That helps with buy-in and it's collaborative and everybody understands what everybody else is saying. Yes, movement and structure. Classroom setup is key for sure. Charging station, your kids would love it. Oh, you're so welcome. These are just, a, this is not an extensive list of things to think about. And you're going to go home, you're going to think, oh, I could have, could have thought of this. I could have thought of that. The give me five, I do love that. I've used that before. Class dojo. I love class dojo, but one of the things I'm trying to break my teachers of is um, using class dojo for every type of communication because I find that it's behind a screen. So you lose a little bit of that intimacy that you have when you pick up the phone and call. Uh, but I love class dojo, especially when you're sending reminders. Sign language. Yes, brain breaks. 
I mean, adults need them, right? So yes. we know our kids and noises, any kind of noise maker you can have. I had like a, uh, uh, it was like a semi um, doorbells. I had a clapper. I had a, one of those cute little bicycle bells. Anything you can get that's novelty um, to keep things fresh is great. Class tag is phenomenal as well. Noise meters. Ooh, that sounds interesting. Yes, those are the things I've seen them before, Heather, in which they are, it looks like a stoplight. Mm -hmm. And if it goes, uh, raises so much noise, it becomes like red and then there's yellow and then there's green. Yeah. It's yeah. really neat. It's like a, a little stoplight. There are so many good ideas. It can be dangerous in kindergarten sometimes, <laughs> though. <laughs> there's always that one student who wants to make it go off. <laughs> Well, you got to test the boundaries, I'm sure. Test the boundaries. You guys have a lot of great ideas. I wish I could, I wish I could take pictures of this chat and share it with my um, teachers. We'll figure out a way. We'll yeah. figure out a way. All right. So um, thank you so much for sharing those ideas. And next we're going to move to student choice and student voice. Uh, this is huge because one of the things I think about when I think about my students is think about the lack of control that they have in their lives. Someone tells them usually what they're going to eat for dinner. Someone tells them in some households what they're going to wear. Um, they have to go to school. They have to have this teacher. They have to ride the bus. They have so many things in their life that they have to do. If we can create an area within our classrooms where they have some freedom that is not only gonna make them feel valued, but it's also gonna make them free to start learning how they are as a thinker and as a human. Um, it gives them space to make mistakes. So I found this quote by John Spencer, and he is um, a great educator who has spent a lot of time investigating student voice and choice. And he said that student choice is more than simply picking a task. It's about owning the entire learning process. So once you flip the script on your kids and turn some boring, watered down SOL into a journey, that changes everything for a kid. It changes their engagement. It changes their ability to think about the topic. And it also changes their learning outcome. So here are some ways that you can offer student choice and student voice. Now, again, this isn't an exhaustive list, but it is a few ideas that you can take with you. And if you're like me, you're probably doing some of these already, but you can tweak the subject, the content, and the topic. Now, I know um, all of us teach in Virginia, so we have the standards of learning that we have to adhere to, but there are ways that you can manipulate the content to fit the activity, especially if it is engaging to students and will make sure they understand the content that you're trying to get them to understand. Learning formats and outcomes. If your kid wants to write a rap about genres, let them. If they want to write a poem about Edgar Allan Poe, even better. If they want to um, do a skit about a mathematical word problem, let them. Whatever you can do to make it flexible and fun for them to show what they know and to celebrate what's in their wheelhouse will pay dividends. And that also pays dividends because in accordance to the science of learning, the students are owning it. That's the student agency. So you've already developed the success criteria and you've matched them out, but these are tasks that are now aligned to your success criteria. And it's the student agency piece. And right. because you created it as a student and you owned it, it's gonna have meaning, it's gonna have value, and you're going to remember that task more than a task that someone gave to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Julia said that she used to do her biology research presentations in rap. I would love to have seen that. Um, I am a pseudo rapper myself. I'd like to rewrite songs and, and rap them to my kids, which they find hysterical. So anything you can do to engage with the content, which can be dry at times, and have the students engaged is great. Materials and resources. This sounds so silly and simplistic, but if you can let them use a pen instead of a pencil or let them use markers instead of colored pencils, any choice you can give them about the, the resource and the, the materials that they use, they love it. 
Um, strategies. So one of the things um, that I've seen teachers do in my school is my favorite, my favorite mistake. And so they'll take a piece of student work where there was a mistake or the problem is incorrect. And she calls it her favorite no. Um, and they talked about what they learned from their mistake. Kids have all sorts of strategies tucked away in their brains. They're not always going to be the same. So if your kid wants to show his work and you have another student who doesn't want to show his work on a math problem, depending upon the kid, let them choose the strategy that's best for them. It will make the learning more their own and it will also it will also end with a better learning outcome. Typically, if students can use the strategy that works best for them, they will get more of the work completed accurately. Audience, I love the raft activity. Role, audience, format, and um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the T. Topic. Topic, thank you, friend. Um, so if you can let them choose their audience, that changes how you present the information. Um, they could be making a, a presentation for their parents or they could be making it for their peers or they could be writing a letter to the editor. If you can change who they're speaking to, it's going to change how they approach the content and how they engage with the content. Um, scaffolding. So I had once had a student named Julia and I was teaching third grade uh, multiplication and I taught her the, the typical algorithm and she started crying and she said, I don't get it. And so I took her out in the hallway and I showed her um, how to break it apart by place value and to get the product that way. And she was much happier. The way you prepare how you teach is going to be based on what each student needs. Don't be afraid to deviate. Um, I took a course with Carol Ann Tomlinson, who is like, I love her. I uh, took two in graduate school and she did this activity where she would show um, a, a a larger student and a smaller student. She obviously talked with them prior to this and she would have them switch coats and try them on. Now, all I can see right now when I'm thinking about this activity is germs because of COVID. <laughs> Think about what that looks like to a student when you show how the same jacket that belongs to someone else is not gonna fit everybody. That's a great conversation to have with your students. I may deviate and give you a different assignment, not because I like you more or not because it's easier or harder, but because this is what fits you. So the way you scaffold how you teach, it's okay to make sure it's varied for each student. And then I put this one last because in elementary school, and I'm sure in secondary, it gets a little crazy, uh, but students choosing partners in small groups. Um, it's not that I, well, I'm a little controlling, um, but it's not that I want to control them. It's just, I'm nervous about some of the pairing. So when you let students pair with other students or in small groups, just make sure you continue to revisit your expectations because sometimes they could be having like a pool party over there and you're like, well, what's happening? Oh, we're just talking. Okay. That's not really completing your work, but <laughs> one way that students really enjoy getting a choice. I like to choose who I work with. I like to choose where I work. Can I work on the floor? Can we work outside? So anytime you can offer student choice and voice is great. And at the secondary level, um, this is a rubric. And it could be a rubric about, in the end, having students, they give feedback to other students about the collaboration. But you have to teach students how to give feedback, first of all, to one another so that it is effective feedback. It's not like, I think you're awful. It's constructive criticism and how it looks like. So creating that safe place, having uh, students work together as partners based on the common agreements that you think as effective groups, and then having the students rate one another. Once they've been taught about the effective feedback, I have found has been very helpful in producing effective grouping when it comes to the secondary level. So very much the same concept, very much, but it's just looking a little different, like the jacket that Heather shared with us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are some other larger things that you can do. You know, you can you can be a pioneer in your in your school. if It doesn't exist already and start student led conferences. That's a, it's a huge thing to give students ownership over their learning. You know, so many times I hear students say uh, my teacher gave me this grade. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Your teacher may have entered the grade into the grade book, but you earned that. 
That's your grade. That's that's you. So I think student-led conferences would be a great idea. Um, celebrating risks, passion projects, student goal setting, that is key. That is key. Anytime you can encourage leadership opportunities, um, sharing their ideas and understandings. And one of the biggest things is letting them engage in discussions and debates, teaching our students how to disagree in a, in a calm and um, civil manner. Uh, that's kind of not taking place always in every pocket of society currently, but we need to be able to teach our students to politely disagree politely disagree and it's okay. We don't have to always agree. So next up is communication. Um, again, we talked about if communication is, is non-existent, it will kill your culture. So make sure as you're thinking about ways to communicate with your students that you're modeling and teaching appropriate communication. Um, you know, this is hard because so much of our personalities are intertwined in our jobs. Um, so you want to make sure that you're um, appropriate, which, as you can tell with me and Dr. Chen, I'm not always appropriate, but with my- No, no, we have a clear understanding. I love, <laughs> I love me some Heather Spade, okay? Well, you just want to make sure because, you know, um, we show our kids, you can't get toothpaste back into the tube, Right. You can't take words back after you've said them. So um, it's just, you just got to teach and model appropriate communication because you can't take it back. Examine your body language. We talk a lot about body language, facial expressions, and gestures. So much of the communication that we convey is nonverbal. Um, it's a very high percentage. I, I can't remember the percentage now, but so much of what we convey is through our facial expressions. It's through um, how we're, our bodies are standing, what our posture looks like. So, and you can tell your students that, but you can also model it as well. The active listening part is huge because they will know if you don't care about them. Um, they, they might be talking about the nightlight um, the bulb that went out and how it was a fiasco at their house. And you might be thinking about how much you need coffee at this point in time, but, but they will know if you're not listening to them. So being an active listener, check for understanding. Um, the way that I communicate um, with my best friend is the exact opposite of the way she communicates. So I'll say something and she'll take it completely in the opposite way. Well, everybody, everybody has those obstacles. It's not just special to me. I'm not just um, challenged in, in the area of communication, the way that you perceive things um, could be mis, miscommunicated. So make sure that you're checking for understanding. Hey, did you understand what I meant when I said blah, 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 blah? Um, and be empathetic and compassionate. Now, everything in the students section could definitely be in the parent section as well. But with your parent and with your parents and your colleagues, I just want to impress upon you. It's okay to be honest with them and tell, tell them what you need and to collaborate with them. Keep it professional, obviously, and be an active listener. But the only way that we get better as professionals is by clear, effective, and honest communication. Um, so if you can do that, you're going to have a phenomenal year with your kids and your parents. One of the ways, um, and I laughed when Dr. Chin said sharing is caring because I was like, oh gosh, I have that on my slide. And it's such a primary thing to say, but- Oh, stop it. Such sharing life. and caring is for everyone. <laughs> it's share the love. Caring. Yeah. One of the ways that you can communicate and share is by having a classroom brochure, sending home a classroom newsletter and sharing your classroom routines. Now this could look like a syllabus in secondary or it could be um, some of the examples that I've showed you here, but the more that you can communicate with your stakeholders, the better. Now, um, in my family, they say, the less you tell my mom, the better. That's not the case for your kids. It's not the case for your parents and it's not the case for your colleagues. If you can make your expectations clear and how you're running your classroom, there will be no confusion and everybody will be on the same page. And the last component of um, cultivating a positive climate is love. Now this is um, super lovey-dovey and I'm sorry for all you left-brainers out there, 
Uh, but I definitely felt like I needed to spend just a minute to talk about this. And I put love yourself in the middle because this one is the most important. As teachers, we are so much more than teachers. We are dental hygienists. We are uh, nurses. We are psychologists for some, some parents. We are a taxi cab. We are instructional leaders. We are, we're so many things. You have to make sure that you care for yourself. As a principal, I'm horrible at boundaries. As a teacher, I was horrible too. But you need to have boundaries so that you have time for your family and time to recoup. You are going around filling hundreds of buckets every day. That's right. Your colleagues, your parents, your students. Who's filling your bucket? How are you refilling your bucket? How are you spending time with loved ones? How are you building yourself back up? Because this, this job, this work, this career, it's not any of those things. It's a calling. And if you're not refilling your bucket, it's going to get empty and it's going to get empty fast. So please make sure you make yourself a priority. Love your students, okay? Now, I will say, you may not like every student. That is okay. But you need to love each of them and realize that they're an individual. I told my fifth graders at fifth grade graduation this year, take care of yourselves because you're an original. There's no other copies of you in the world. Your students are the same. They're an original. They're very unique. So love them for who they are and help them to become a better version of themselves. Love learning. Never stop learning and steal from your colleagues, okay? There are tons of geniuses in the educational world, and I steal from every single one of them that I come in contact with because That's right. you know, that I don't know everything, and I never will. So continue. Heather Spade, sticky fingers. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> learning. And continue your love of teaching. Your craft is never done, okay? Your year might be done, but you're always going to be a reflective practitioner. Think about things you can do better or do differently or tweak to make sure that your teaching is the best that it can be. So now we have an activity. I feel like I dumped a ton of information on you. Um, so it's pretty much like you've been in a classroom teaching all day. So you're welcome. The activity today we're gonna do is called a classroom tour. And I did this activity um, and I did this activity my first year of teaching. Um, I had this whole, the whole day planned out and I did the classroom tour and it took half the time I thought it was going to take. I remember calling my mom after my first day of teaching and I was like, they didn't teach me anything I needed to know in college. And, um, but it was fine. We, we pressed on and I eventually got 12 years of successful teaching experience under my belt. Um, but what I did was I, I had the students tell me what they wanted to know about the room. And so that helped me kind of get my routine set and start to learn the students' names. So the activity we have for you is a classroom tour. And what we want you to do is you're going to get in your groups that you had prior. So you'll be in your same group. I want well, you I, don't, I don't know if we'll, because we're going to do the random groups again. Oh, okay. So sorry, just JK, you're not going to have the same people. <laughs> But I want you to think about um, what your first day is going to be like. Now, some of you have zero years of experience and some of you have multiple years of experience, but I want you to think about what you want your first day to be like. Um, what do you want them to know about their new classroom environment? What do, what do you want them to know about you? Um, and why did you choose this particular topic? So we went over several things. So choose at least one topic, because if you choose everything in the kitchen sink, you'll end up talking about everything and then it'll be like a therapy session and you know we don't know where to mail the checks to so pick a topic that you want to focus on for the new year coming up knowing that we're coming off of COVID-19 and starting a new year what which one of these resonated with you most do you want to talk about creating connections do you want to talk about how you're going to organize your classroom do you want to talk about things that you're going to do to organize voice and choice or do you want to talk about ways to communicate with your your students, parents, and colleagues. So think about that. And I'm going to have Dr. Chin um, put you into. Well, break. actually, because of my internet, um, and thank you for your belief in this, where I am. Um, Bailey, do you mind helping us with putting in the groups no more um, than yeah. four? No and more they, than four. Gotcha. Yeah. And then uh, there'll be random groups again. And then um, 
can someone remind me who the Appomattox group, what is the name for that? So I don't pull you guys with them. Amy Huskin. Amy Huskin. And then it was. Yeah, you're, we're good. We're going to, if this is Amy, we're, um, we're going to just hang out as our, as our own group. That's okay. Gotcha. Yeah, that's just totally... don't press join when it pops uh, up. Okay. Yeah. We're just going to mute you guys and hang out and do our thing. Here. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, I'm opening all, all those rooms up. There should be 14. Thank you. And then I get a question. Yes. Ask. Um, it's ask. about the organization thing, because um, thinking about organizing the classroom, do we know what we're going to be allowed to do with students this coming year? Girl, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, center wise, are they like, what, what can I do and what can't I do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a great question. So what I would do is we always try and plan for every single like option. So uh, your administrator is going to let, let, let you know, this is going to come from the governor, of course. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I'm sure that our state superintendent knows, they'll let our all the superintendents know and the superintendents will communicate that. Mm -hmm. But I would say that the best thing is to think about it of what what it might look like. You know, you almost have to think about it, what it might look like in our district. We've talked about what does it look like at three feet and what does it look like at six feet? Mm -hmm. And we've had to plan for both. It's a lot of planning, but we wanted you guys to have the time to talk with other colleagues in this PLC that we've created so that you guys can decide what might this look at three feet and what might this look like at six feet? Because we don't know right now. And that is such a great question, Denise. So I would think about two scenarios and just prepare. And then it might end up that we, we have no restrictions and that's still something, but at least you planned and thought about it. Great question. Wow, Denise, you're amazing. All right, so what we're going to do is we're just going to be talking about this. We don't have to write any. Someone can jot something down if they want to jot something down, but this is not as formalized as the last activity. Um, Heather wanted you guys to relax a little bit more, which I thought was really kind of her. So just talk, have fun with this, choose a topic, know why, think about it from three feet, six feet, and we'll see you in about 20 minutes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. All oh, right. There you go. Oh, perfect. Go ahead. All right. So um, when I talked things over with, with my group of other coworkers in the middle school in mathematics, a couple of things we talked about that were important were organization's key from every little component. So, so even the minor details to the big picture. Uh, a big thing that we did this year uh, due to uh, be, that we started because of the restrictions, uh, all of our teachers, they, we asked, we did uh, daily check-ins to see how the students are doing. So like, we'll ask them simple questions like, how are you feeling today? Uh, what mood are you in? So like, for me, like we just did like these little emojis, this picture, yeah. so like happy, you're tired, you're energetic, you're good. And then I'll always ask a random question of the day. So it might be some silly, like what's your favorite ice cream player? It might be some silly mm -hmm. riddle. It just gets them thinking. And uh, and from time to time, before I even get into the, the lesson, I was I'll teach them, I'll go over the question and want student engagement. So I'll call on kids randomly by doing like a little wheel of choice and get them to share their thoughts. So definitely those are two things like our group really touched upon. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. I Absolutely. love the chickens. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Woo, middle school. Middle school. Woo -woo! Yeah, go ahead. Woo -woo! I think I saw Mario, did you have your hand raised or was that from last time? Yes, it was. I can share okay. it really quick. Um, I apologize. I missed who was in my group. There are other names, but they had a great discussion. Um, we talked about what we're going, how our classrooms will be set up, and um, how we want them to look. So uh, one thing I shared is I wanted my classroom to be broken into three sections: science and teaching, history. I'll have like the main classroom setting. I'll have a reading section where the lights are a little bit dimmed. And then I'll have a research All section right. um, for my students where they basically have updated books, content, newspaper, articles, or whatever that pertains to the units that we are currently studying. This way, they have extra material outside of what I'm teaching that they can go into and research for a project essay or whatever they're uh, having them do. So that's what I had awesome. done. Um, uh, if, if the rest of my group want to share, they also had great ideas. 
Thank you, Mario. That's awesome. I love that you're making other things available to them. Thank you. Anybody else want to go? It's getting to be that time. All right, Dr. Shen, would you like to share your screen so that we can close this out for our wonderful learners for today? Yes. So I thought that, are we not? It's still wonky? Yeah, it's still wonky. So can you get me back to? Here, I'll do it. The reflections. I'm on the reflections page. Yep, I'm gonna share right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, can you make that big if you don't mind? All right, thank you so much. All right, so thank you so much for joining us with this exercise that, and we hope that you can see how the teacher clarity piece um, is very important in organization clarity as well too. And especially with students coming back from COVID-19, it's really important for us to think about what our classrooms are gonna look like and how do we continue to have a positive environment so optimal learning uh, will continue. So at this point in time, what I'd like for you is to take some time by yourself and think about three things. One thing that you learned today, one thing that you will try, and then the last question, what role do you think does teacher clarity play in student learning? So I want you to take the time to think about that. And then we're gonna do a little, like you choose the one, student choice, student voice, you know, like modeling that piece, for instance, put the number and put your response, put the number and your response. But I really would like for you guys to take, before you do anything, Take the time and think about all those three questions and then decide which one you want to share out with all our friends today. All right. All right. So do you want to read some of these, Heather, and just share out? Because I think it's always important to, to hear it from multiple places, to hear it, not only to write it, but to read it as well, too, and to hear it. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. I don't want to just pick. So I'm just going to, you know, I at the top. Yeah. You're gonna start at the top. Start at the top, girl. So Linnell said she's gonna incorporate more movement and routine into her counseling lessons. I love that. Um, Dr. Chen said she learned that we're in this all together and it's best if we collaborate. Focus on offering. Denise, focus on offering as much student choice as possible. That is so valuable and it's sometimes difficult. So I like that you're going out there and doing it. Don't give students information to just fill time. Make sure you are 100% on what matters, not just information dumping. Josh, that is so true. Culture killers, yes, we gotta avoid culture killers. I will try student-led group norm discussions and practices. That's gonna be really valuable. I think you're gonna enjoy that. Success criteria, yes. Consistent, consistent expectations, yes. I will try the lottery picker. Yes, you're gonna love it, Dr. Jen. Student clarity can only exist in presence of teacher clarity. I'm gonna say that again, because that's deep. Student clarity can only exist in the presence of teacher clarity. Oh, I think that's a book for Dr. John Almaro, but yeah, he's I think gotta copyright it first from that person who took it. Like he can't Jordan Green, it. hopefully Jordan will sell it. Yeah, Jordan, sell it. Don't let Dr. John take it away from you. We heard it first here and it's being recorded by you. All right, go ahead. How to unpack the standards in order to continue to grow in more effective and specific learning intentions and success criteria that's so, that so right. Clarity is crucial for ensuring students understand what they are trying to learn or supposed to be doing. Clarity is important in every aspect of the classroom daily. How can you learn if you don't know what you're supposed to be learning? Absolutely. Teacher clarity is so important and allows us to get the best bang for our buck. Yes, you have to start here as you unpack your standards. Yes. You have to start here as you unpack the standards. Yes, yes, yes. Um, learned, importance of routines. Okay, two, we'll try structured morning routines from day one and incorporating lottery gadget and charging station as new options for spicing things up. Good for you. Teacher clarity brings out trust. You're absolutely right. That was kind of the elephant in the room that we never really said, but you called us, called us out on that, Deborah. Good job. When I am clear in my organization as a teacher, I am free. I have free up time for students to be learning. Absolutely true. 
We'll try to create a classroom community to build connections and facilitate a safe learning environment. Yes, nonverbal cues, yes. Teacher clarity is important to teacher and student success in the classroom, absolutely. Clarity, clarity being effective to come up with a plan for possible restrictions that may affect a classroom flow, absolutely. Right. Classroom flow is essential. My response kind of hits all three, even though I started with number two, student voice, student choice is something I wanna to try to put more um, of in my classroom because it isn't just giving the students an option between A and B, it is actually allowing students a chance to take charge of their learning. So they actually have a say in the way they process and learn the material. Clarity plays a role in student learning because the more clear the teacher is in expectations, directions, et cetera, the more engagement the teacher will have yes. and the students will feel more connected and involved in their learning. That is great, Lydia, well said. To use student choice and voice more often, I really get nervous to doing this with some students. I do too. I do too. That's why I was like, uh, full disclosure, I don't always like to let them pick. So, but yes, yeah. Creating choice in my classroom is a way that goes deeper than simply allowing them to choose a task. Finding new tasks to allow students to take control of their own learning. Absolutely. Student voice and choice. Learn more about clarity and unpacking standards and how it impacts student learning in terms of reaching deep understanding and learning. And that's what we're going for. We'll think about voice and organization as our plan. Students need the engagement that voice provides. Absolutely. Two, more choice and assignments, choice boards. Oh, I love that, choice boards. How to improve clarity and lesson planning, communication and routines and organization. Reflect on last year and edit routines, procedures, and rubrics for clarity. Oh, I love that. Also incorporate more student choice in art materials and projects, maximize classroom time, and motivate students to reach high goals with clear and fair expectations. Great job, Katrina. Clarity equals quality instruction. So true, Denise. Charging stations, yes. Oh, I'll work on more voice. <laughs> Jordan says she wants the royalties if he gets a bigger following. I don't yeah, 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 Jordan, you got the royalties. You got the royalties. It's been tape recorded. No one's going to steal it from you. And I learned how to manage my class, implementing all the strategies I will take with me, student choice and voice. Nice. Thank you, Jalisa. You guys are amazing. You guys really are amazing. Um, so at this point in time, we had a little bit of time to reflect on it. So what we wanted to ask you, one of the ways that you can always end uh, a particular closure, just so that you guys know, is you can take your success criteria and form them into questions. So, can you write effective learning intentions? Can you write effective success criteria? Can you organize your thinking to plan tasks that are aligned with my success criteria? Can you identify specific strategies that promote a positive classroom environment? And can you explain how establishing classroom expectations and routines play an important role in teacher clarity and student learning? So think about those things because that's the journey that we went on today. If you don't mind as a last thing before we say goodbye today, but then we're gonna come back Thursday together, some of us, and, and Heather may join us on Thursday. I may be forcing her to, it's called Force <laughs> Kitty Love, but you'll see us back and you'll have Wednesday and then Thursday again. Um, go ahead and put, we just, we always love feedback to know how best to improve because this is your time and it's valuable time. So on a number of one through five, if you think that we were able to meet those criteria, that's five, you know, somewhere in between. One, I have no idea why I was even here. You were speaking Chinese, Lisa Chen. Um, I have no idea what's going on, okay? Uh, yeah, okay. So please uh, take the time and just give us a number so that we know how to improve next time. But on behalf of Louisa County Public Schools, we wanna thank you. Uh, Heather, Dr. John, Cheryl and I wanna thank you for being you. This time is not easy. What you're doing is heroic work. The thinking that is going behind the planning, I don't think, until you've taught, I don't think people understand just how much it's a love for learning and a love for your kids because we certainly don't get paid enough, but you guys are just so amazing. So thank you for just making this journey and you're, you're, we're continuing on this journey. Just amazing for each and every one of us. Thank you.